These have uh, hit a, a popular era, and we'll be talking about that. But uh, 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 Simon is not only uh, well published in the area, I think he's in the process of finishing a commentary on the Gospel of Thomas. He's also published on the Gospel of Judas and uh, a number of other, of, of other prominent publications. Quite an accomplished scholar. Joining Simon on the stand today. Uh, we've got, where do we go next? Let's go to David Capes. If you'll take a seat, David. David is the Thomas Nelson Research Professor. He is at HBU, Houston Baptist. Uh, teaches courses in New Testament, uh, Old Testament, Paul, Jesus, and uh, is well qualified to sit on this panel. He has co-authored or authored a number of books uh, 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 in this field, and it's going to be interesting. I'll tell you more about each of these gentlemen through the question process, because some of my questions about them uh, deal with their uh, expertise. So we'll go through it in that way as well. Peter, why don't we pull you up next? This is Peter Davids. Uh, this is, Peter is a visiting professor in Christianity at HBU. He uh, uh, has his PhD from across the pond at the University of Manchester. Teaches New Testament, Old Testament, uh, teachings of Jesus. Uh, uh, is a, a Greek scholar as well is well published in a number of different areas, uh, uh, commentaries, uh, a lot of, of things in the lesser known epistles, no, lesser popularly studied epistles in the New Testament. Let's go down to the epistles of the New Testament. Yes, yes, yes that's how to start all. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah he'll, he'll tell us why uh, Jews quotes from the Pseudepigrapha. Let me tell you that we've now brought up David Chapman. David is, uh, 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 teaches Greek, he teaches Hebrew, he teaches uh, the, the epistles in the New Testament, uh, New Testament graduate seminars, he's the world of the New Testament, he's also a great New Testament scholar who's come to us from St. Louis today uh, to be with us as well, uh, uh, and we're honored to have him. Now, if you've been uh, watching the media much, if you watch TV, if you read the bestseller list on the New York Times bestsellers, if you uh, uh, are tuned in and, and, and find all of these bizarre gospels and the new secret gospel and everything that's been found, you know that there's quite a, a public buzz out there. So, Simon Gavrikol, I'm going to ask you this question to start us out. You've published in a number of these Gospels. Uh, tell us, what is it that first interested you in studying Gospels outside of the New Testament? Is this working? Yeah. That's working. Yeah. A little bit? Yeah, good. Um, yeah, thanks for that question. Um, what interested me, I, I think it was partly the, the, co the combination. This was around 2004, 2005. Uh, when I got interested in this area, I was just finishing my second second book and looking at looking for something. Okay, we're going to have some trouble here, so get the mic closer okay, or sure. give us a little more volume. Um, I was thinking about what project to do next, and uh, the, the combination, really, of lots of debate going on in the scholarly world about these Gospels uh, and their relation to the New Testament Gospels. You know, uh, are all of these Gospels? equally reliable, equally interpretations of Jesus, uh, should we prioritize some Gospels over others? O obviously for Christians, the, the four New Testament Gospels will always be the binding uh, fourfold Gospel canon. But for your average New Testament scholar who's approaching really from a historical angle, which of these Gospels are useful, uh, useless, 
That's, that, that's, that's a, a debate that goes on in the scholarly realm. But at the same time as that, you've obviously got the kind of Da Vinci Code uh, popular side of things, which uh, I guess is, you know, certainly in 2005, six when I was starting to work on this area uh, was very much in the air in 2006 we had the Da Vinci Code film uh, and the, the Gospel of Judas was released uh, I, I got rung up by phoned up by radio stations saying you know what, what are we what should we do with this Gospel of Judas uh, and, it's, and it seemed to be generating a lot of heat uh, and so I thought you know this is an area which uh, is you know maybe one which is going to merit some study every 20 years or so there's some book that comes out that makes a big impact arguing that Jesus was married to Mary Magdalene or something, you know, something like that. In, in the 1960s there was um, Nikos Kazantzakis' film and book The Last Temptation of Christ. In the, then 20 years later in the 1980s there was um, Michael Bajant and Richard Lee's book Holy, Holy Grail, Holy Blood. And then, you know, in due time, another 20 years, after that, there was the Da Vinci Code. So probably in 20 years' time, again, there's going to be another kind of goofy, multi-million selling book like this. Uh, and so it's probably a useful area for, for Christians to, to know about and, and to be involved in scholarship in. So that, that was, I guess, the reason why I got interested in working in this area. What, why do you think, Simon, while you've still got the microphone, why do you think that there is so much media hype why, why, why this popularity in the media for these bizarro gospels? Well, I think there's always a, there's you know everyone loves a conspiracy theory, don't they? And it's, especially if it's something like uh, the Vatican has been you know hiding these gospels, or, or you know it, it set out to destroy them two thousand years ago, uh, and, and now we finally discovered the truth that w which the Vatican or whoever has been has been concealing. Um, just as just as the conspiracy theories around the assassination of JFK, you know, attracts a huge literature of who might have done it, and who, who uh, and, and so on. You know, in our, in our culture, there's there's a kind of, a, I guess, distrust of authority, which which leads us, which which leads people to kind of get obsessed about, you know, what the, what the, what what about what's wrong with the official truth? There must be something wrong with this official truth. Uh, and, and, and the, the authorities have probably been concealing the truth from us, so it's, it's great excitement when we can get, a, get, a, get an angle on what the, the hidden truth is. If you pass the microphone to Peter Davies, Peter, I want to uh, launch from there and ask you, do you perceive any type of, of uh, what, what, what is it within people that, that makes this nouveau gospel, weird gospel, media hype gospel, what is it that makes us want to hear these things? I actually think two things. One is the, uh, everyone likes to have the secret inside story. So there's been some secret somebody's hiding from me somewhere. And you know, I know the truth about Barack Obama or whatever the case may be, I got the secret. And you, you, no matter how weird it is, we know it. You know, and you don't. I, I think there's that. And with Jesus, who could be more important to get the secret on than Jesus? And we've had lots of people within the church and around the church saying, well, I've got the secret handshake that really, uh, you know, lets me in. I think the second thing is I think we really want to avoid the canonical Jesus. Um, dispensationalism had one way of doing it. Uh, I grew up in a dispensationalist church. We did not preach in the Gospels. Um, we preached on Paul and so on. The Gospels were for the millennium. And uh, therefore, we could avoid Jesus quite successfully other than know the basics of the story as he did that. Um, and uh, other people have had other ways of doing it. And this is another way of doing it. You avoid them. Um, after all, it's uh, not the Jesus of the canonical Gospels so to speak, that you encounter in the Gospel of Thomas or the Gospel of Judas or something like that, you're getting something else that feels perhaps a bit safer, especially if you don't really understand what they're talking about. If you pass the microphone down here to David, David Capes. All right, now you've published not just on Paul, you've published on the Gospels. You're one of the driving forces behind uh, one of the most recent Bible translations, The Voice which itself has stirred quite a bit of media hype. 
Yes. Uh, uh, and let me first ask you, in terms of what uh, uh, we just heard from, from Peter, um, do you think that, that there's this desire of people to avoid confronting the canonical Jesus, the Jesus in the New Testament, and has it affected, for example, the way you translated the voice, the new uh, Bible version? It's a great question. Let me think about that. Uh, several compatriots in, in this crime of translating the Bible are around here, Peter Davis one and also Kelly Hall, who is one of our writers and poets in the project. Uh, I think, and, and, and ben, uh, ben as well, Ben Blackwell was one of our helpers on that. Uh, I think the Jesus of the scriptures is pretty darn demanding and demands that we change our ways, that we seek first the kingdom and not our own agendas, not our own personal comforts, not our own affluence. And I think that runs contrary to pretty much everything in our culture. And so it, it sounds much better to have a Jesus who doesn't say those kinds of demanding things of us. And I don't think that we, in a sense, dumbed anything down. I think the Jesus that we found in our text is a pretty demanding figure, a very polarizing figure. People looked at Jesus as either you are the Lord and Messiah or you are a heretic who needs to, to, to be destroyed. And I think that what's happening today is there are people who are wanting to choose the latter, not to call him Lord and Messiah, but to say we need to destroy this image that we have been born with, that we have grown up with, that has shaped our society. Uh, I do think that in a real, any kind of translation, you have to take seriously the words of Jesus and the context of Jesus and the things he said. And I think he frightens us a bit because he demands too much of us. I think I'm wrong. All right, uh, if you'd pass the, the microphone down to, to David for a moment, please. David, you not only teach, but you train people who teach. You train the preachers, you train a lot of educators. Um, this desire to have the secret news, or the latest, the greatest, the buzz, um, how does it affect the way you believe we need to be educating uh, not just ministers, but educating people within church for those of us who teach at church. How does, uh, what are the implications for us? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I, I think um, one, one of the things that, uh, let me speak personally, I think growing up in the church, a, a wonderful Bible-believing church, there were some things that we chose, or the, the people who even knew what they were talking about, to, chose not to bring into the church. Uh, into adult education in particular. So, so you, you don't worry people in the pew about certain things. And, and one of those things is um, some of the more difficult challenges to the historic Christian faith. And so if, if you were, you can, there can be a fear that if you talk about non-canonical gospels, uh, the gospels that represent a Christianity that is different than the, gospel, than the historic gospels, the, for canonical gospels, um, that you, you might un imbalance some people in the pew, scare them a bit, and that that could be a, a dangerous thing, but, and certainly uh, potentially a bad thing. And so one of the things that happens is that we, we don't tell people about stuff. And so then all of a sudden, something like, like Simon mentioned, the Da Vinci Code comes along and has a, a, a conspiracy theory uh, that's very splashy, that talks about a lot of Gospels that people have never read. Uh, it, that is, it, I think, a, is in and of itself quite dangerous because we've, it, it seems like we've been hiding something from people. Um, and if we've been hiding it from them, uh, maybe there's a reason. That, that's, that's effectively kind of what hangs over the Da Vinci Code. So, so to give a, um, a a more even direct answer to your question, I think what we need to do in terms of theological education, uh, in the seminary where I'm training um, people for pastoral ministry, and also uh, in the pew, uh, in adult Sunday school, for instance, like you do, it is to, to bring the difficult topics in, the topics uh, so that we prepare people before they hear it. It's kind of, you know, I've got 
uh, two teenage daughters. One's a senior in high school, one's uh, a freshman. And uh, so the senior next year goes off to college and, and she's no longer, you know, in the safe confines of her home. And I'm very glad that at school she's confronted with uh, the culture of the day. Um, and that then she can come home and we can talk about it. Um, I, I think we should do more of that in the church where, where we bring up the difficult topics in the church so that people are prepared when they go into the society. And, and, when they're no longer in our safe confines of the church, uh, that they, they know how to respond to people. Okay, if you'd hang on to the microphone for just a moment, I need to take a poll. How many of you in the churches you go to have had an opportunity to study or to have presented information or data about these non-biblical gospels? Gospel of Judas, Gospel of Thomas, a good number of you, maybe, well, I say that, maybe about 30% of you. Now, I need mean something beyond someone who preached a sermon on why the Da Vinci Code is hooey. Uh, uh, um, okay. Now, in, in that regard, uh, uh, David, while you've got the microphone, uh, what, and, and I'm sure we'll hear more of this tomorrow night from Simon, so I'm not giving him the mic on this. We're starting with you. But uh, uh, what are the distinctions you see that are important for us to realize when we're looking at the gospel account itself? Uh, and I'm thinking in terms of the resurrection, uh, uh, the crucifixion, those types of things. Uh, uh, put it into context for us. Yeah, okay. Um, I think one of the first things that I think of when I think of the four canonical Gospels is that they have um, apostolic authority. They, they go back to the apostles in some form. So uh, historically, Mark, for instance, is a follower of Peter. And so I, I think that Peter's Gospel, what he told people when he went from town to town, is effectively written down in the Gospel of Mark. So you have something apostolic, something immediate. You have, you have a story that's also very rooted in history. It has a, a very authentic feel to this. I know um, Simon's going to cover some of this, as you say, tomorrow night. It, 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 you get the nitty-gritty feel of actually being in Jerusalem with Jesus when he goes to the cross. And uh, one of the things that's so important about that is if there is any historical fact, I, I, I may say again tomorrow night, but um, I see myself as a New Testament um, academic training people in seminary as kind of having two hats simultaneously. I'm a historian and I'm a theologian. I, I think historically about what was it that Paul and the Gospels were actually teaching in their day, and then theologically I think, what's the import for us today? And historically, um, there is no question that the central feature of the first century about Jesus is, is he was crucified. That, that, that is the central thing that comes out from history. We see that in the Gospels, of course. We see it in Paul, the writings of Paul. We see it in the writings throughout the Holy Testament. It, what's so striking about that, of course, is that if you are, um, if you're in the first century and you're wanting to start a new religion, you probably don't want your, figure, your main figure to be crucified. So the fact that they constantly go there showed that it's historic reality, right? But beyond that, if you go to pagan authors such as uh, Tacitus or Lucian, the one thing they really know about Jesus is he was crucified. If you go to Jewish authors, I, I would argue even Josephus is important here, um, they know he's crucified. So if there's one historical fact, it's that. And of course, theologically, this is central to the Christian faith, that Jesus died on behalf as a ransom for sinners. You see that in Jesus' own sayings. You also see it in the Lord's Supper. So, so historically, theologically, crucifixion absolutely important. If, if you go to many of these Gospels, especially the four that Simon's going to talk about tomorrow night, you'll see that the crucifixion is a very minor player. And that just doesn't work historically, and it certainly doesn't work theologically. So that's, that's one of the distinctions that you can make between the canonical and the non Okay, all of you teach New Testament, right? In some way, shape, form, or fashion. And, and, and in fairness to you guys, I asked them if they wanted to give me some questions that they'd like me to ask them so that they don't feel like they're being ambushed by a trial lawyer. So <laughs> I have these questions that they've asked 
but I've got my own to ambush them as a trial lawyer. <laughs> this one is not on their question sheet. Just curious. And the key to this is, guys, tell us the unvarnished opinion that you have. And if you've got an opinion that you don't want taped and available for the world to know, then uh, tell us that and we'll delete it. But we'd still like to know here because we're the lurid generation that wants to know all the secrets that you've been talking about. So here's the question. Of the four Gospels that we have in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there's been a lot of scholarly discussion over the last 200 years over which was written first. I think most everybody will give John position of last Gospel, but I'm curious. Go down the road, who's got, who wants, yeah, that's the mic. Uh, let Kate start this one. Who, which one's first? Yeah, I, I think the first written gospel, uh, in terms of what we have today, there may have been earlier texts that we don't have things, bits and pieces written that, that are used, but I think Mark was probably the first written gospel. And then I would follow it up with Matthew, and then Luke and John. All right, so your priority, Mark. I'm, not, I'm the priority of Mark guy. Yeah, I'm probably not alone here on that, but I, I do think Mark, I think there are reasons for that. But you'd have to really be looking at a lot of text to make the argument that Mark is prior to Matthew here, or Mark is prior to Luke here. Okay. Simon, do you I, agree? I, yeah, I agree. I, I would go for Mark, um, Matthew, Luke, John. Um, I think uh, as well as all the internal stuff, in, in Mark, Matthew, and Luke, that, that um, scholars talk about a lot. I mean, I mean, the, the argument is commonly made that it, it makes much more sense to see Matthew and Luke as expanding Mark in particular places uh, than to see Mark as an abbreviation of Matthew. Uh, and, and one could go on about all those kinds of things. I also get the impression from Papias, who's one of our earliest church fathers, who was writing probably very beginning of the second century, possibly late first century. Uh, Papias seems to talk about Mark first before he talks about Matthew, and that may give a clue that even even in the time of Papias, uh, it was known that Mark was written before Matthew. Okay, David, I would just have to agree. No. Yeah, your priority Mark too. I, yes, and again, Papias also indicates that that Peter was the person that. The source for Mark is source for Mark. And so it makes sense, even though you don't think of Mark, Mark's not an apostle. And so why would Mark be first and the other people use him? Well, if, if Mark is recording what Peter has to say, then there's a lot of reason for that. I almost burst out laughing when you asked the question because I spent uh, Tuesday, too much of Tuesday, um, reviewing a book for a friend of mine, in, actually in Indonesia, that purports that Mark is the last well, not last, uh, perhaps last of the synoptics, that Matthew came out in segments and that the commonality, which, which segments uh, between Matthew and Luke, which, which segments uh, Matthew, uh, Luke knew, and both of them were written before Mark. Um, Mark using both of them and then abstracting them for a, um, um, for a uh, sort of a gospel handbook, preacher's handbook. The more I read, the more convinced I became a Marvin priority. <laughs> uh, it's sort of if this is what you have to twist yourself through, and uh, these are the number of unbelievable things you have to um, sort of consume before breakfast, um, then um, uh, it, uh, with, well, not the perfect the uh, theory by any means. I mean, there's always been problems otherwise. It would be an open and check case, so no, I doubt for Mark. Okay. Now, in terms of, of part of the issue here, is there, if we've got Mark as the first gospel, which all four of you seem to agree on, followed by, uh, are you all in agreement on whether Matthew or Luke follows, doesn't make that much difference, but you'll put John last, Everybody puts John last? Okay. So we've got these three synoptic Gospels. And if we were looking at them in the Greek, we would see times where they use the exact same phrases. 
but we'll also see opportunities where Matthew and Luke will leave out something that Mark has or will add something beyond what Mark said. Here's my question. Was there an evolving story about Jesus that evolved over time from the short Gospel of Mark to the larger Gospel of Matthew to the largest Gospel of Luke? Was it an evolving story or was the story set and it was simply an evolving or a different need to give additional data. Does that question make sense? We'll start with whoever wants to start, but I'd like to hear from each of you on it. As, as I'm sure all of you know, at the beginning of Luke's Gospel, Luke says that many people before him had undertaken to written to write, to write an account of these things over like, the you know, um, So it seems very unlikely to me that there were no sources that uh, Luke had except Matthew and um, Matthew and Mark. Uh, as you know, I'll touch on this a little bit tomorrow, but only very briefly. Um, as you know, at the end of of the Acts of the Apostles, uh, well. In the middle of the Acts of the Apostles, suddenly uh, the author starts saying, we went here, and we went there, and we went to this other place. The narrator joins the party in, 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 in Acts 15 in Troas. And uh, one of the interesting things about that is that some of the people that Luke meets right at the end of, of Acts uh, are the Jerusalem Apostles. So, so Luke has additional sources. He, he meets James, he meets the, what he, the people he calls the Jerusalem elders. Uh, and so Luke has lots of opportunities to, to, to meet these other people and get their parts of the story, not just the story of Acts, but also the story of the Gospel. Uh, so that's how, that's how Luke knows that there have been lots and lots of accounts that have, that have been made before. Luke's got lots of additional sources. Luke has all the parables that uh, that Matthew and Mark don't have. Only Luke has the parable of the, uh, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. The, no, sorry, not. Uh, only Luke has the parable of the lost son. Uh, only Luke has the parable of the good Samaritan. So he he, he has some extra sources, which don't seem to have evolved uh, just through you know the telephone game. I think you call it over here. We call it Chinese whispers. Uh, but, <laughs> But um, so I think it makes it makes better sense to see that, that, that Luke and Mark and Luke and Matthew is just having additional sources which uh, Mark either uh, didn't have or or chose not to use. There are also some some deletions that happen along the way as well. So neither Matthew or Luke nor Luke includes everything in Mark. Okay, in a, in a true synoptic fashion. I will give each of you a chance to either repeat what he said, the way the Gospels seem to do with Mark often, to add to it, to subtract to it, or simply to say, yes. I agree. <laughs> I, I do think we have to take seriously the, the Gospels as individual writers and evangelists who, who have a purpose in writing and an audience to whom they're writing. Mark's gospel, the first gospel written, I would argue, uh, does not have infancy narratives, right? That is nothing. It starts with John the Baptizer, or John the Dipper. We almost call it John the Dipper in the translation. It's, I'm just kidding. Really. But John the Immerser, John the Baptist, uh, starts with him and Jesus being baptized. Jesus is roughly, according to Luke, 30 years old when that happens. But I think there is increasing, and, and this happens too in the apocryphal gospels, these non-canonical gospels. There's this great interest in things about Jesus that, wait a minute, what happened before he was baptized? And so they're, they're there to some degree to try to fill in those blanks. I mean, the gospel, infancy gospel of Thomas tells us what kind of five-year-old Jesus would have been, right? The kinds of things that happened in the five-year-olds. Now, I don't think any of those are historically true, but you have to admit there has to be a lot of interest in those kinds of questions. And I think the initial gospel, the gospel of Mark, I've made the case in a publication a while back, that the gospel of Mark really is written as a script for imitation. That we are called to imitate Christ, 
But how do you do that without a story of how he lived? We're called to walk as he walked, to love as he loved, to forgive as he forgave. It's the gospel that gives us the story of how that has worked out. And I think that's part of Mark's purpose, to show us what it means to follow, really follow Christ. I don't mean get behind me and let's walk in a straight line, but what it means to really follow. And that means to imitate the life of Christ, which, which also is, is parenthetically an imitation of God's life. Im imitating God, because Christ is God in the flesh. So I think we have to take very seriously the, each writer and their, their own purposes as best, much as we can discern them uh, today, and the audiences to which they're writing, and f sort of work backwards to say, well, what, what were their sources? What sources would they have had available to them which would have told them about the infancy, which would have given them information about other parables and such? Okay, before you pass the mic, I want to ask a follow-up question to you, and then we'll go back, down and hear what their views are on the initial question. We talked about the idea that these additional Gospels appeal to the masses of the 21st century because we're a information and a secret hungry people. We want to know the skinny. We want to know what no one else knows. We want the latest. We're on the internet to get the latest news, rumor, gossip, conspiracy, whatever. So it feeds that within us. Do you believe in the early church, there was at least a desire after the Gospel of Mark is put out there for more information, more data. Tell us more about Jesus. And could that have been behind some of the uh, other synoptic Gospels? And I, I would also say put John there. I think John is probably working in awareness that these other Gospels have been written. And, and perhaps there's a discussion going on, it's been going on for a long time, whether John is intentionally trying to supplement and add to this, the accounts and give us kind of an insider story to there. Uh, I, would, I would think so. I mean, uh, for those of us who are in the faith, it boils down to that we love Jesus. We want to know more about Jesus. And tell me more. Give me more. And I, I think that's, that's an impulse that we have. Maybe it comes from the Spirit. Maybe it comes from our just desire to know more information. But I, I just think it's there. And I think that is what is energizing some of these other accounts. All right. David, can you pick up uh, and give us your thoughts? Yeah, well, just to tie into some of the things that David was just recently saying, uh, one of the things that I like to say with our students um, is that uh, what, what, why do we have four Gospels? Well, why not just one? But in, in theory, you could take the four Gospels if what you're interested in is just a, a bare factual history of Jesus' life. You can take the four Gospels and, and construct that, construct a harmony is what it's called. This was done even in the second century by an amputation in the, the Diatessaron, which we'll probably want to refer to at some point, because it is the very fact that he went to the four Gospels in order to produce his harmony shows that it was the four Gospels that were known to be the, the accurate historical records of who Jesus is. But you could do that in theory. The question is, why don't we do that in the Christian church? And that's because I think uh, historically, you have um, people of apostolic voice speaking as to who Jesus is. But theologically, you also have God behind that, giving us four different accounts that each have their own emphases that complement one another. You, you don't have to see these uh, rivaling one another. I don't think you would see that normally in the church. What you, what you do see is, is that each um, author brings out something with greater emphasis. So, uh, for example, you can think of, of the end of, of uh, Matthew with the Great Commission. Now, we, we tend to think of that as primarily about missions and people going, but the whole of those uh, last four or five verses really forms a kind of summary conclusion to the whole Gospel of Matthew. So he's emphasizing the authority that Jesus has. He's emphasizing that people um, worship to Jesus. That's a theme that shows up at the beginning of the Gospel and is emphasized at the end. So, so in his, the way that he's concluding his gospel, he's emphasizing certain things that he wants you to say, here is how you should respond to Jesus. Some doubt, you should worship. And, and then in worshiping Christ, he calls for outreach to the nations. And, and so what we see there is, again, four historical accounts, but each with their own theological emphases, all of which God intends for us to see. 
So, so if we were to reduce those four to one, it would be uh, we there'd be a loss in the church theologically as well as historically. All right, Peter. I'm rather famous. I don't know whether I'm famous, but I should, should really. I'm at least known in class for telling stories about my family. Um, it, it illustrate this or that point. I think they like the stories better than they like the um, stuff they're going to be tested on. <laughs> but um, I say that's because I don't have to clear this because it's my secrets that I'm sharing. It's not quite true. It's sometimes my wife's. But, uh, <laughs> who by the way is here? Uh, my point is, I tell the story somewhat differently depending on what context I'm telling it in. Um, I'm telling the story shaped for the point, uh, leaving out details, bringing in details, shaped for the point I'm trying to make in class. And or, I hope this will, will support whatever triggered me at that point. And uh, on the one hand, I'd see the Gospels of doing this. On the other hand, I'd also say that the Gospels are shaped by somebody's telling and retelling the story we know from memory studies that our memories shape um, and, and shift, um, not radically, evolve maybe, as we, we um, uh, tell them. Some of them are shaped by um, uh, a desire for, if I could say, for make them rhetorically more um, fitting or whatever the case may be. Um, and so when they get written down by the next generation, and I'd see all gospel writers as, uh, shall I say, second generation, um, I think uh, the Informant of the fourth gospel is a Judean follower of Jesus, but I don't. But I think it's a second generation type of recording of his stuff. Um, they've been shaped by, yes, cross influence, but also by people's telling and retelling uh, for different contexts. Okay, another uh, 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 question out of left field. Put you on the spot for a moment. Uh, if uh, a number of these folks go to church with me, will be in my class uh, Sunday morning. And this Sunday morning, we're going to be talking about textual criticism. What, how do we know what really was in the original autograph New Testament writings? In that regard, uh, I want to ask you each question. The story of the woman caught in adultery in John in the original gospel or not? Peter, you've got the mic, we'll start with you. It'll be, in, just as an aside, it'll be interesting to see where it is in the Nestle Levant 28th edition, which is due out, but no. Um, not, not. Actually, it'll be in double brackets, I'm sure. Yeah, so you say not in the original. Not in the original. All right. I, I would have to agree with that because it's not found in the earliest manuscripts, it's found in the later manuscripts. Um, but also because um, we hear of it kind of secondhand through um, other church fathers, Eusebius speaks of other church fathers knowing this, this episode, um, but not tying it to the Gospel of John. And so I, I think that, that means that it was in circulation, um, but it wasn't initially connected to the Gospel. Okay, very good. Simon? I agree with what he said, yeah. Um, um, Eusebius says that it comes in the Gospel of Hebrews. Um, one manuscript of John's Gospel includes it, but notes in the margin that it comes from the Gospel of Thomas. So it, it's kind of known to, to have a good pedigree, but not canonical. Okay, David? Yeah, I would, I would agree, I don't think it's original to the, to the, to the first edition of John. Uh, I, I wonder sometimes if we should think about these documents as being static. Uh, once published, always published. Is, is it possible that uh, John's community took another run through and added things later? I don't know that. I don't know that. It's just a question that I have. Uh, we clearly, when we publish books today, they are often edited, re-edited, and things added in a later edition. I'm wondering if that's a possibility in ancient, ancient world, um, if, that, if that happened. All right. I, I think, uh, uh, and, and I would not take issue, I think 
uh, that you guys have done a great job at, at illustrating certainly what I've been taught and, and come to believe myself, and that is that it's, it's an addition to the original autograph of John. But here's the reason I bring it up. Uh, would you each say that there is at least some good evidence that there's credibility to the story being factually accurate, even though it may not have been in the original issue of John? And I catch the hint from each of you that while you may not bet your entire life on it, you at least probably think more likely than not it's got historical accuracy. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I, I, would, I, would, I would agree with that, yeah. All right, Simon, yeah. not on the head will do, because the probably big question I'm probably more skeptical. You're more skeptical, okay. I'm somewhat in between on this. <laughs> <laughs> Because, yeah, yeah. because, for instance, the, the, the fact that it does show up and you say it does show it has some, some antiquity yeah. to it. So that now, Eusebius, for the benefit of everybody else out here, is 4th century. That's right, 4th century church historian, but he t typically uh, just simply records what he's reading in the library and it's true. It's he's reading. True. So, um, and he used that library, I might add, for those who want to know. Yeah. Yeah. And then the other part of it is that my two favorite Michael Card songs, or among my favorite Michael Card songs, are on this passage, and it's just so hard to want to get that. <laughs> and, and, and I might add that Michael Card has an Easter DVD coming out that he recorded in this chat. Um, go ahead. Well, it, it fits with my preferred reading of John, uh, or my preferred reading and understanding of Jesus. So, um, uh, in, my, in my at least constructed world, um, it's, it's authentic. Um, whether in my uh, historical world it's authentic or not, I um, say, um, you know, only God knows. Okay, now, with that as the preface, and understanding where you all stand on that issue, here's my question. In your studies of the non-canonical Gospels, the Gospels that the Church decided are not authoritative, do you find any stories or vignettes or sayings that you tend to think this is not a canonical gospel, but I think there's substantial reason to think this story may be factually accurate, even if it's not inspired scripture? And if so, give us an example of how, what you have come to think. If you and I, I, these aren't scripted. I mean, these guys or put on the spot with these questions, and you feel free to pass, except for Simon. Simon, you cannot pass, because you've published on too many of these. Sure. I think, I think one of the difficulties with this question is that, um, one of the difficulties with, with answering this question is, is that it's very, very unlikely that all the stuff in the Apocryphal Gospels is, is completely made up. So I, I'm sure that in, even in the Gospel of Thomas, in some of the other Jewish Christian Gospels, I'm sure that there is some stuff in there that probably goes back to Jesus. The difficulty is, how, how, do, you, how, do, you come, how do you work out what, what, might have, what might have done? Scholars used to use what, what, are, what are called the criteria of authenticity. Uh, now the criteria of authenticity, if you haven't come across them before, are things like, if you translated this back into Aramaic, does it have a kind of Jesus-type rhythm to the teaching? Uh, does it cohere with other sayings of Jesus? Uh, could it just have been invented by the early church? Uh, could it just have been something that any Jew could have said and found its way into the Gospels? Um, now, increasingly, scholars have become really skeptical about whether these criteria work. So, for example, the one about the, the one about uh, could this have been made up by someone in the church? Well, the church often agreed with Jesus. So, the fact that something could have been said by someone in the early church is not an argument against it being said by Jesus. And similarly, Jesus was a Jew, so the idea that it could have been said by any Jew is no reason why it couldn't have been said by Jesus as well. So, the, the, the reason why I I'm confident that the material in the four Gospels is, is accurate is because the, the overall picture of, of the four Gospels gives a, a kind of 
a solid, reliable portrait of, 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 of Jesus. When you've got a gospel like, for example, the Gospel of Thomas, which in its overall picture is, is very, very skewed, it's, it's then very difficult to have confidence in any, in any particular saying. Now, there are some. I mean, one, one of the most famous ones is, is the, the saying, Gospel of Thomas, saying 82, which also appears in some other places in Origin and elsewhere uh, in the third century. He who is near me is near the fire. He who is far from me is far from the kingdom. Now, that sounds like the kind of thing that Jesus might have said, sort of coherent with what he said. It has that sort of urgency, that, that sort of urgency about it, the sort of fire language, the language of judgment. Jesus emphasis on the kingdom, emphasis on accepting him, being near him. So that kind of saying could have been, could go back to, could go back to Jesus, but that, that's all one can say really. Could could go back to him. David. Yeah, I, I think I would agree with that. Uh, and I, I think more of the Gospel of Thomas than I do some of the other ones because it's a list of 114 sayings, I think it is, in Coptic. And I think probably some of those likely went back to Jesus in some form or another. But then you come to saying number 114, which is the last saying where uh, it's uh, one of the disciples says to Jesus, calls Mary to leave us, but women are not fit for the kingdom of God. I'm paraphrasing here. And Jesus said, no, leave her alone, for I will lead her to make her male. For every female who makes herself male will enter the kingdom of God. Now that strikes me as probably not Jesus. <laughs> I'm just taking a wild guess there. But it seems to me that that's probably not authentic. But, you know, there are a couple of, of parables early on in the Gospel of Thomas that are pretty close to the Gospel of the Sower and some of the others. So, which is some, we've argued about which is the earliest and, and such. Uh, but I, I do think that there are some of those in the Gospel of Thomas that do have likelihood of going back to Jesus. It, it is hard, though, to make that decision. I think there are some I can surely lob off, like number 114, because I don't see anything and like that. we're going to come back to Simon on Logia 114 in a minute. But first, I want to know from David and Peter, if there are any things that you have seen in the apocryphal Gospels that you think may be, uh, you know, maybe historically accurate. Yeah. Um, I, I appreciate both of the responses, and I, I think maybe to say it in a slightly different way, you know, you, if you had a, a very unhistorical account about, say, John F. Kennedy, uh, you would still expect it to have a few actual pieces of fact, you know. And so even if something is more than 100 years removed from the events, which most of these Gospels are, um, it's possible that there's some remembrances in there that are not in the canonical Gospels there. Uh, isolating those, being confident of them is, is difficult to give you a, a sense of that. Uh, there's been an ongoing discussion over well over 100 years of uh, isolated sayings that are not just in these non-canonical Gospels, but some of the early church fathers, such as Jerome, or Eusebius, or Clement of Alexandria, Origen, record s some isolated sayings, not a bunch, they just have a few, that they've heard, maybe from some of these non-canonical gospels or from other sources, this is something else that Jesus said. Now, what is so striking about that is, is that none of those same authors then said, let's reopen the canon, you know, or at least let's add this extra saying in there and kind of as an appendix at the end. But the canon for them was still the four canonical gospels. Those were the four. That's what people were going with. And, and they had confidence about the character and the veracity of the entirety of those Gospels and their apostolic character. You, you don't have that same confidence about any of these other non-canonical Gospels. But there is the possibility that they have some isolated sayings. To, to give you an ex some specifics here, one, one of the famous works on this subject on the unknown sayings of Jesus, sayings that are outside the, the Gospels, but um, or, or elsewhere, uh, and, and might be authentic, is by jo Joachim Irenaeus. And, and he is able to list, now he, here it comes, thinking that we have, you know, that, that if you have the Da Vinci Code build up and there's all these, these Gospels out there, which there aren't, we'll get to that, but all these Gospels out there, you're expecting there to be a huge list. He has a total of about 20 that he goes through and he settles on roughly 18 sayings. And by sayings, I mean these are one-liners, sometimes two or three-liners. 
Rarely does it even make to a parable. So you've got about 18 in Jeremias. In, in a later uh, work on the same subject matter, uh, kind of a, a major German study by somebody who's not like super conservative or anything, but a man named Afri Hofius, he narrowed those 18 down to seven, only four of which he has some level of confidence at. And, and Simon quoted one of them to you right there, right back, back in his response. So, so it's not like we've got this huge number that scholars are saying we've got all these other sayings. And, and the one last thing I'd add to that is uh, often I get in, in class um, the hypothetical question, you, you know, um, it appears just from some of the things that Paul wrote that he may have written a letter to the Laodiceans in addition to Colossians, Philippians, etc. What if we came across that letter? Would you include it in the canon? It's a big question that people want to ask. And, and I, I, it'd be interesting, I, I don't want to be the only person to answer that. I kind of want to retract and say maybe other people should get in on this, but, but my very quick response is, first, you have to work very, very hard to convince enough people that you've actually found that letter, you know? And that's the same thing going on with these things. As I said, 21 comes down to four. That's people fighting over the specifics. Can we even be sure historically? And then secondly, theologically, I think we as a church should have confidence that the people who knew the apostles were most close to the events were, were the right people to say, these are the four gospels that we're gonna stand behind. And so I, I'm not looking to reopen things, even though it's an interesting historical hypothesis, both about Paul and frankly about, you know, might we find some sayings here that are potentially have something about the struggle of Jesus. Peter? Yeah, one of the, one of the problems, of course, looking at anything in the, um, uh, in, in these other Gospels is if it is, let's say, authentic, it's also on a context. And you can have something of uh, in a context that means quite didn't makes it mean something quite different than what you believe Jesus could have meant by it, uh, even though it could stem from him, could be a genuine word from him. I might you could use the illustration that if I were suddenly to start saying fire, 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 you know, you'd probably start clearing out of here if you thought I was serious about it, or at least start looking around for where the fire could be. But if I was out with a group of troops and uh, suddenly said, fire, 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 <laughs> um, they would get another message. Hopefully they wouldn't start running away. <laughs> but they <laughs> would uh, uh, put their weapons at the ready and start letting off volley after volley, hopefully. Um, so your context can change the whole meaning of a word. Now, I'm sure there are things that go back to Jesus. The question is, again, in identifying in my own field, it's not a gospel, um, but uh, James 1, 3.18, well, this uh, word, um, uh, the, uh, those who make peace sow the seeds of uh, peace or the justice by their peaceful acts. That's the way it is in the Common English Bible. Or the fruit of uh, righteousness is sown as peace by those making peace. Um, sounds awful Jesus-like. We know that James uses the saying of Jesus, James 5.12, it's very clearly uh, unattributed saying of Jesus. Um, uh, because we know we have it in Matthew 5.35. Uh, literally something so close to it that it must, that they're, that they're related. James 5.12, <laughs> Uh, James 5.12 is he saying um, essentially uh, uh, don't swear at all um, but, but you're yes be yes yes you're no 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 you know you're no no and so on and um, well this is interesting I think uh, John Kloppenberg is, is right when he says James probably weaves in material of Jesus by a uh, a rhetorical technique common in this day known as emulatio, uh, where you try to rephrase and actually work a person's thought into your composition. That's all very interesting, but it actually doesn't make any difference <laughs> in one sense. Where it doesn't make any difference is, it'd be real interesting maybe someday to meet James and say, say, did that come from Jesus or is that just 
you know, because you sound similar. And you just, uh, and find the answer to it. In fact, what I have it is, I have it in a context in James. And if Jesus said it, I don't have the Jesus context in which he may have said it. Uh, so I say, yeah, you know, it shows a tremendous family resemblance. That could be Jesus. And there's not the only one in James that we have. Well, that could be Jesus. But so what? <laughs> if it, you know, if I were minded to say that was, that definitely Jesus, I wouldn't know where to put it in the gospel. Because I don't have the context. Okay. Um, if we get the microphone back to Simon. Simon, if you're going to cover Logie at 114 tomorrow night, we won't make you do it now. But if it's not in your lecture tomorrow night, uh, why don't you explain to us the story about Jesus and women? Sure. I, I'm going to mention it tomorrow night, but not, not really. Uh, yeah, the, the Logia 114 uh, begins. It might help for you to explain, for some people, what do we mean when we say Logia 114? Oh, um, Logion is the Greek word for an oracle or a saying. So people talk about the Gospel of Thomas having 114 Logia, which is the plural of Logion. Uh, so this is the last one, this is the climax. Uh, uh, climactic utterance of Jesus in the in the Gospel of Thomas, and it begins. Simon Peter asks Jesus, or tells Jesus, uh, "Lead Mary, take Mary away from us, for women are not worthy of life." And Jesus replies, uh, "I will I will lead Mary in order to make her male, uh, for all women who make themselves male shall enter the kingdom." Uh, now, I, I think that this presupposes the kind of situation that one has in, in well, I was going to say in second century Christianity, but that actually, the idea actually goes back to really sort of Aristotle, that, that women are a kind of deficient form of, of men. And you find this in influencing uh, various theological strands within the second century. So, for example, uh, the, theolo the great theologian, one who sometimes called the arch heretic Valentinus, uh, set up one rival school to the, the main church in the second century, and he had a, 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 a two, two pupils, uh, Theodotus and Heraclian, and both of them talk about uh, women being a, a deficient form of, 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 of males, uh, influenced by this kind of Aristotelian strand uh, of philosophy. Um, so, so th those are two examples of theologians who think that women that therefore need to make up for their deficiency by, by becoming male. And you find it also in some of the uh, Nag Hammadi writings, which was, Nag Hammadi was the, the, the place near which uh, 13, well, 12, strictly speaking, 12 volumes of uh, Gnostic writings, as they're sometimes called, uh, the Nag Hammadi scriptures. Uh, and in some of these works, you find this God, is in Egypt. This is in Egypt. So a, a bunch of works which survive in Coptic. Three, four hundred A.D. Yeah, the, 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 the Coptic manuscripts go back to about four hundred A.D., uh, and they were translated from original Greek texts, which were written earlier in the second or third century. Uh, and in some of these, God is described. The supreme God is described as thrice male. So he's not just male, he's three times male, he's sort of uber, uber male. Uh, and, and, and this, and this is the, 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 this means that the Supreme God is, is not subject to any kind of deficiency, you know, often in comparison with uh, the Creator God, who in some Nagamani writings is, is a deficient God who creates this terrible world that we live in. Uh, the Supreme God, who's up in the, you know, the supreme realm of light, uh, is, is thrice male. So in a lot of these writings, you, you have that underlying assumption that, that maleness is fullness, femaleness is deficiency. And that's, I think, what you have in Logion 114 of the Gospel of Thomas, that, that Mary needs to have her spiritual deficiency made up for uh, by, by Jesus. Um, Martin, 
you know, what's ironic is that, that there are scholars, uh, I think of Elaine Pagels and others, that say that, that these texts are really more pro-women than the Gospels, Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That the Christian scriptures are more misogynist and anti-women, but you have an elevated view of women here. Uh, and I just don't see, I don't understand that part of, of their thinking. It's Maybe there's a deficiency. I don't know. I'm just kidding. Uh, I, 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 no, I just, sorry, Mark. But I, I just don't, I don't understand how you can hear that and understand that string of philosophy and come out saying, well, well this, these gospels or these writings are more pro-women and are better for women than Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Paul. Because it's Luke's gospel that tells us that Jesus, Luke chapter 8, verse 22, that, that Jesus' ministry is being, in a sense, bankrolled by women. Women are supporting his ministry. And this at a time when conventionally it was said, well, it's a shame for a man to be supported by a woman. But Jesus readily takes their help and does so gratefully. So I'm just wondering, I just, do you have any thoughts? Can I ask the Sure. Do you have any thoughts about why people like Elaine Pagels and others or feminist theologians think that these texts are more favorable to women than the Christian scriptures that we have, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I think one, one, one point is that some of the female characters who are mentioned very briefly in the New Testament are expanded upon, upon a lot in, in, in early Christian writings. So Salome, for example, uh, the, the, is one of those disciples mentioned in, in Luke 8, 1 and 2. Um, uh, she, she, is, she gets a, a whole life story attached to her, and she's uh, one of the big players in some of the Nal Kamali texts. Of course, one of the one of the Gnostic texts, it's actually not from Nal Kamali, but was discovered earlier, the Gospel of Mary. Uh, there, there's a whole, I'll mention it again in the lecture tomorrow night. There's there's a whole gospel attributed uh, to Mary Magdalene, and she's obviously seen as a kind of alternative route back to Jesus, uh, a, a kind of unconventional choice, a bit like Judas. Really. You know, they're, they're both figures who, hey, if we knew what they they knew, then we could maybe get behind again, get behind these uh, nasty canonical gospels and find out who Jesus really was. So there's a lot of interest in Mary Magdalene, uh, not just in the Gospel of Mary, but in, in in the Gospel of Philip again, as a as a figure who who who, who maybe knew things that the apostles didn't. So that may be why Mary in particular is is seized upon as as a source of authority. Um, you know, I think in some ways it also, it's, it's a great question, David. I, I, I think it goes back in some ways to the opening discussion as to why is there an interest in these Gospels to begin with. And I, I think for, for one, it, um, there's a esotericism, I don't know, is that the right word? They're, they're very esoteric, uh, the Gospels, these are. And, and so they, they seem more mystical as a result. And so there's, there's some scholars in particular, and Pagels is among them, that, who are very interested in kind of a more esoteric form of religion than you have in historic Christianity. So there's, that's one thing. I think another thing is, is that um, in anything that decenters historic Christianity, if historic Christianity is understood to be misogynist, which I don't think is a fair take, by the way, but but it is a fair take on some strands within historic Christianity. I have to be honest, you know. So, so if if you decenter um, historic Christianity, then all of a sudden you're left up to a much more pluralistic set of possibilities. I think that's one of the great attractions of these Gospels for a lot of people is it ties into a 21st century Western, especially American, desire for pluralism so that we can each decide our own religious pathway, and much as you guys were saying earlier, um, and Peter both, um, you, you, know, you no longer have the claims of Christ, you have a lot more flexibility. So I think that's another aspect that's indirectly attached. Um, while, you know, there's also these, these lady, women figures that are more high than that. Yeah, it'd be unfair uh, for me to say, well, perhaps, uh, you know, uh, the, those Gospels have been more favorable to her career. Uh, and, um, <laughs> but I suspect 
theft that there's a tendency to read them symbolically uh, also because if you read the male male as rationality and read female as as emotionality which would be pretty typical uh, in, in, in those culture, then you, you essentially get rid of the particulars and you just say, yes, we all have to be rational about this, but uh, surprisingly rational in the sense that you're trying to be, uh, I, I do think there's something to the, your, your, your whole um, uh, mystical thing um, uh, there. And, um, you know, you can make quite a whole career on that. Okay, originally what we had planned to do was to take a, a brief break, go across and, and have a chance for people to use the facilities and, and to grab a refreshment or a drink. But I think in light of the way we're doing time-wise, what we may do if y'all can bear with us, let's do about 15 more minutes of panel, then we'll take the break, and the panel can go in there, and y'all will have a chance to engage them, in a sense, on one-on-one, -on -one. And, and we'll just uh, put the break at the end instead of in the middle. If we take it now, we'll have trouble coming back for the last 20 minutes of something. So let's do 20 minutes now, then we'll take the break if y'all are okay, and the panel's okay with that. And then uh, you can let these folks uh, uh, kind of engage you in a little one-on-one -on -one over a, a bottle of water. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, uh, let me walk through where we've been uh, a little bit and show you where I'd like to take the conversation next. Um, with the understanding of the canonical gospels and what they have to say and how they were written and how you see supplementation from Matthew and Luke and John, what Mark wrote, is it fair to say that there was really a trajectory that you have a life of Christ, but then after that life of Christ, you have a trajectory of growing tradition that grew enough for the four canonical Gospels, but as that trajectory continued to grow, the church just kind of gratuitously chopped it off after the verse 4. And what you're seeing in these non-canonical Gospels is the continued trajectory as opposed to uh, uh, another way to see it. Would you see it that way? Would you see it differently? Uh, comment on my, my question, however you choose. Charles? You walked out. Well, we've decided to stay in here for about 15 more minutes and uh, uh, go up to about 4 o'clock. Then we'll retire and let them ask the panel discussions one-on-one -on -one out there. Charles has been waiting for you all with water. He just came back in to the side. Um, okay, so who wants to start? Is it trajectory or is it apostolic authority ends, the genuine stories end, and then you've just got hybrid... Uh, religions cropping up that are grabbing what they can and reinterpreting it to fit their do doctrine and dogma. I'm going to jump in. Yes. Because <laughs> <laughs> I think there's, a little, there's probably a little bit of both. Um, I think you have, uh, I mean, you, you have traditions. Uh, you have Luke saying he knew many versions. Which ones of those did he leave out? Which ones of these did, uh, those did he did he bother? You know, could he check out? Did he check out? Or did he just say, nah, not that one? You know, I don't know. I'd love to see his research notes. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, I just can't. But my guess is there must have been. People, I mean, we know how false memories are created. We know that they can be created quite early. Uh, that people can take all over on memories from other people. Uh, we uh, so there must have been a need for some pruning. If Mark is from Peter, which I take it to be, then. You have whatever Mark remembered Peter did, you know, and then you, maybe you only have one source and you have less pruning there. But, yeah, I mean, as things go on, as people keep on telling stories, you know, the six-inch fish often becomes a foot and a half long. Uh, and other things, and, and, and the fight, you know, just pulling it out of the water becomes a, an hour-long fight. But, um, 
uh, but also as different perspective, philosophical perspectives come in, I think you start changing things. So, yeah, there's, you know, in one sense I'd say, what did the church do is, it said, uh, so to speak, after some of these others were already in existence. I mean, let's face it, you don't have canon lists until, uh, or people talking about them, until there's these, some of these others are floating around. And what they're saying is, no, that one, that one has the ring of authenticity to it. And they're saying, this one, uh-uh. You know, so, uh, and stop reading that in church, because when you read it in church, that's when people heard it, because most people couldn't read it. So, I mean, I mean that's basically what a canon list is. I guess we'll just go down the road this direction. It's, it's, um, I, you know, the, the way you frame the question, Mark, and I know you're framing it in light of how many people would ask the question, um, especially in the academic community. Um, I'm a, a bit uncomfortable with the, with the idea of a growth in the amount of tradition, because what it sounds like is the later, when I hear that, it's like this much at the beginning was probably true, but they were adding more stuff because it kind of sounds good. And if you're saying that's part of what's going on with the canonical gospels, I'm, I'm very uncomfortable with that. I think uh, the Gospel of John indicates at the end, you know, he says that uh, effectively if, if uh, I'm going to basically, he's concluding and he's saying if, if there was, uh, if everything that Jesus did was written down, you know, the world couldn't contain the number of books effectively. So there's a lot of other true things that Jesus did that were not recorded in John's day. And I think when John came to writing, he had some idea what other people had recorded. He was recording some of the things that he was filling in around the corners. But he was doing so not on the basis of expanding tradition, but on tradition that was already there. Everybody's having to select from the tradition that's there that they know. So I would frame it more that direction than I would the way that you said it. And then the other aspect of it is uh, the way that you framed it. It, it kind of also sounded like there's, it, it, there's this continuity, and all of a sudden there's this almost arbitrary line uh, that that if you remove the line, you would see that, that there's still a straight line graph coming out. And I don't think that line was at all arbitrary. It was apostolic, it was first century, it was people who knew Jesus, it was eyewitnesses. That's a very key thing that, that Luke draws on, Papias mentions as well. Something that the early church is very concerned about was um, you, trial lawyer. Um, what, what would a first century trial lawyer care about? And, and it was eyewitnesses. What was your most, what was the, the best proof you could bring with somebody who actually saw it? And when the eyewitnesses start to disappear, that's when things start, you get s stuff told in ways that isn't true to the actual Jesus. And the early church was aware of that, and so they, they drew a line that ended effectively with the eyewitnesses. This might sound a bit sort of strange, but one of the limitations that was also placed on, on, on what they could include, and I agree with what's been said already about there, there being a huge, I mean, if you think about Jesus' ministry being three years, and all we've got is these four little Gospels, uh, you, you don't have to be Einstein to figure out that a lot of stuff is being left out. You, know, you, get, these, you get a lot of off-the-cuff remarks in Mark, in Mark and other places. Jesus went into the surrounding villages and preached the kingdom. What did he say when he was there? You know, we, we, we don't know, all that stuff's been, been left out. But another constraint that was, was on these writers was how long was the scroll that they had? How much could they, how much could they afford? How much had, so for example, if, if Theophilus has commissioned Luke to write a gospel and has maybe said to Luke, I'll bankroll 100 copies of this, uh, that may sound like a strange thing, but one of the things that I read recently in an article um, which struck me was that Luke and Acts are exactly the same length within something like 0.2%. 35 foot scrolls, they fill them exactly. Yeah, so Luke has got an exact length of a scroll that he's, that he's filling. Um, that's going to mean that he had to cut some stuff out. 
And had to end one and start the next. Sorry? <laughs> and had to end Luke and yeah. start Acts because he's on scroll two. Yeah. Yeah. I think we see in the New Testament a couple of traje tra trajectories already sort of established. Uh, I don't think that we find the, the, the sweet, sweet spirit of kind of unity that we like to have seen. Paul's letters and some of the Gospels, the letters of John, for example, talk about struggles and strife that they're having. So I think they're already set on some different trajectories. I think there's a Mathean sort of Jacobean trajectory. Uh, I think there's got to be a Pauline trajectory thrown in there. There's probably a Johannine trajectory. There may be something else. I would put, I would probably put Mark, though the tradition locates it with Peter. I think Paul's pretty influential in, in Mark's, uh, Mark's thinking, Mark's theologizing. So I, I think you already have Mark of a number of trajectories being started in the New Testament. I don't think that there's the sweet kind of unity we like to imagine there was. I think it was a, a pretty, uh, at times, difficult place. Uh, there's struggles and strife that, that, that they're working through, trying to figure this stuff out. And uh, I, I, whether that expands, uh, I would just historically, I think there's evidence that there is expansion. But there's also checks and balances that are applied later on to say, no, this is outside the pale. We, we can't include this. Uh, so I do think we ought to see early Christianity not as just sort of a single pure trajectory, but really three or maybe four different movements uh, coming out that are going to, to some degree, coalesce. They're going to agree. They're going to disagree. There's going to be issues and problems that they face. But at the end of the day, they're able to put Paul beside with Peter in a text. You know, they're able to put John and Matthew in the same, same canon. So, yeah, I, you, let, let me give you a little addition there. Actually, I see it um, with a couple of analogies. Um, I stick something in my refrigerator and sometimes it keeps on growing. <laughs> um, I usually don't see some of the growth it may be organically connected, but I recognize it as um, uh, not part of the good stuff. And if I can, I, I excise it. Um, you know, uh, I had some cheese the other day that we removed some growths from. Uh, the cheese was still edible, but um, you need to know where to stop. Um, or I watch your gardeners out here and you have plants and they've grown and they're at the size they want and a sucker starts off in a different direction it's organically part of the process but they know to come up with the shears and um, snip that's gone no that's not part of what of of the really authentic whatever the plant is i know we've done that enough of roses um, and so on. So in one sense, yeah, it's an organic process, but there's limits. Okay, so while we're dealing with analogies, <laughs> if I were to put an analogy together uh, uh, from, from my perspective, and this is Mark talking as Mark, and I'm just asking a question, because my last question is kind of baiting you a little bit. My analogy would be what happened in the life of Christ, the events, the teachings, uh, we could equate them to balls of yarn. And this ball of yarn existed. These things happened. So did this. So did this. So did this. The gospel writers take those balls of yarn and they weave together the tapestry of the valid yarn, the valid things that occurred, but they weave together those truths historical truths into a tapestry that presents the picture of those truths in a fashion that drives their message. Okay. To me, you're dealing then with real yarn that comes from real truths as opposed to non-canonical gospels, which may grab some yarn out of the basket of real truths, but grabs lots of other yarns so that they've got different colors to paint a different, or to, to weave a different tapestry that presents a picture that they want a picture. In other words, it's not a I'm not a trajectory guy in that sense. I am in your sense, David. 
But I, I was hoping y'all would say what you said, David, which is, no, this was not an evolving Jesus. It might have been an evolving understanding of the actual Jesus. But the actual Jesus was the actual Jesus. These were the facts. And people were growing in how they understood them. But there's a difference between growing in how you understand facts and present facts versus bring in things that are not facts. Comments. I think as well as drawing on the same balls of yarn, to you know, I think it's a helpful analogy actually, there is, there's also a, a common, that, that we've talked a lot about the gospel writers having different purposes. So Luke writes it, that Theophilus might have certainty in the things that he's taught. Matthew seems to be, Matthew's gospel, as, as you may well know, has five blocks of teaching. And so is often regarded as a kind of handbook of early Christian teaching in a way that's not true of Mark, which has a much more sort of dynamic structure. John's Gospel is different again. And we've, we've emphasized the differences a lot. Um, but as well as drawing on the same yarn, balls of yarn, they also have a, a common picture that they, they come up with. And this, this goes back to the point that David was making earlier about crucifixion being central. That there's a kind of irreducible core of stuff that you just have to say if you're telling the Gospel about Jesus. You, you, you know, you, you don't have to talk about the birth, but you do have to talk about the, tri the trial and the, the passion and the crucifixion. You do have to talk about the resurrection, even if only, like Mark does, kind of, you know, in a, I wasn't going to say a little bit, because the, the passion predictions come up, come up the, the, the resurrection predictions come up a, a lot in Mark, but it, it's, quite oblique, it's quite obliquely told at the end. Um, we know that there's been a resurrection at the end of Mark's Gospel, but it's not sort of narrated. So there, there's, a, there's a common source of material, uh, but there's a, and there are different angles that each of the Gospel writers want to, to have and to, to use. Um, but at the same time, there's a, there's a, common, there's a, there's a lot of common, commonality to the pictures that they weave. I appreciate the distinction between sort of facts and interpretation. I, I take it that it, whenever it, that these things happened, that they moved at some point to a period of tradition, oral tradition, where these things were being said and interpreted and contextualized. I don't think that that's necessarily outside of providence. I see providence at work in all of that. But uh, even if there are different ways of sort of understanding and interpreting Jesus, I don't see them at odds. I see them really just as, as, as uh, just complementary ways of expressing this and going back to an authentic tradition that they're drawing from. But I, I don't, I'm not able to extract the interpretive element out of it. Um, there's a, and this is a, an example, I don't we have time for it, but thanks. Uh, you know, there's, it, there's a saying in, in Matthew where it says, Jesus said, blessed are poor in spirit. And then in another gospel that says, blessed are the poor. Blessed are you poor. And so people are puzzled. Well, which one did Jesus say? Did he say this or did he say that? Well, in a sense, and I don't mean to be tried here, but Jesus never said either one of them. Because he never spoke a word of English. I, I, think, we have to be, I think we have to understand that uh, what we have is an English translation of a Greek text of a person who's likely speaking in Aramaic. And that's got to be put into some interpretive grid that is useful for all of us. I, I do think it's possible for Jesus to have said, I agree with N.T. Wright and others, that it's possible for Jesus to have said certain things more than once. You know, if you're a teacher, if you got a really good lecture, you don't just give it once and be done with it. You've probably given the same lecture, you know, four or five times or in different places. So I think we say things over and over again. We, we contextualize them differently. But I think we have to understand the interpretive process between the event itself, the happening, and, and then finally, when it's put through the interpretive process of it being written down, and then we translators working through that and bringing it to a modern audience. I really see the hand of providence through all of that. I don't see that it's, we're just stepped up to us, and it's, it's our best guess, and who knows if we got it right. I just add one thing before I pass on. Um, 
to pass on the microphone that is not pass on myself. Um, <laughs> um, and it's just a, a, a statement that Paul makes in passing in 1 Corinthians, um, and, and which is a striking statement when you think of the fact that Paul thinks of himself as the chosen vessel for the Gentiles. Through him is revealed the mysteries uh, of, of the Gentiles being in Christ. He, he alone fills up the sufferings of Christ. Uh, in his in his flesh and so on, and yet he says in, after that catalogue of resurrection appearances in one Corinthians fifteen, and first the Lord appeared to James and Peter, and then to the other disciples, and then to the apostles, and then to, finally to me, and he says, uh, so whether it's I or they talking, this is what we preach, and this is what you have believed. Paul sees himself. Paul sees all of these people as preaching preaching the same message. They, 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 they've had arguments in the past, in, as you can see in Galatians, but they, they preach the same core gospel. Yeah, that's, that's very helpful. And that, um, and that kind of reemphasizes a theme that you had just a few minutes ago. I, you know, um, I, I've been a bit privy to what Simon's going to present tomorrow night. And I, I should say, first of all, you guys should come because it, it's going to be really good. Um, sorry not to raise the bar too high on you, Simon, you know, now, now the expectations are heavy, but that, it's going to be very good. But one of the things that I appreciate about Simon's uh, plan structure is that he has a, a large section in the center where he gives you a sense of this is how these non-canonical gospels sound, and you get kind of snippets of the different gospels. We, we touched on one with that strange Logion number 114 kind of thing, but, but there's a lot of that in the end. And I think that that is helpful, uh, again, tying into what you just mentioned, in that if, if you read, a, you know, scholars like to pick at nuances. And if you just have the four Gospels in front of you, scholars can take a lot of time um, finding out if this word is slightly different than this word. And, and we're good at that. And I, I spend a lot of time doing that myself. Um, and in the process, you, you overlook that that sense that you get that the tapestry, to use your metaphor and then come back to your concept, is, is really the same among the four Gospels. The big picture that Jesus came, taught, um, brought, he was teaching about the kingdom of God, that he brought in miracles as signs to show that the, the kingdom was approaching. He, he predicted his, re, his, his death and resurrection. He, he established the Lord's Supper to commemorate that. He, he dies and he's raised from the dead. That, that's, you know that. that that's, I, I, you, you immediately see that's the four canonical Gospels right there. You go to the other Gospels and that's not what you see. And most of them. Uh, possible exception say the Gospel of Peter. We don't know about some other fragmentary Gospels. We just don't have enough of them. Um, but especially with the four Gospels that you're going to look at that are most Gnostic in their sound. And that's, I think, one of the things that's very helpful about looking at the non-canonical Gospels, is it gives you a, a better sense of the coherence of the early Christian message that is true for all, I would say, 27 canonical New Testament books. That there's a striking coherence there that is made all the more obvious when you look at the non-canonical works. And that, that's really important, and it's another reason why I think, boy, it's great to just go ahead and show the church in a, in a careful, guarded, controlled method these are what some of the other non-canonical Gospels we, we are saying. They're not canonical. We don't think that they necessarily at times even have good theology. But, but take a quick look at them and now come back and appreciate what the church has always held to be true in the four canonical Gospels. And truth doesn't always mean same. When I was growing up, uh, I grew up for the first 10 years, or the first, until I was about 10, yeah, in Syracuse, New York. Born British parents, uh, went through the school system there, and in um, and the last year I was there, we studied American history, center of American history, Civil War. Moved from there to Lynchburg, Virginia. I was going into grade seven. It was still for them elementary school, and in the curriculum, what you studied was Virginia history. The center of Virginia history was the Civil War. I graduated from there, uh, from, from high school in Lynchburg, Virginia, went to Wheaton College. They forced us to go to Reserve Officer Training Corps, and uh, one of the courses which I had to take was military history. 
key turning point of military history is the Civil War. I had three perspectives on the same thing. But you know, they all agreed in who won which battle. They all agreed basically on the roots of where went what. You know, it's true that in the North they were not interested in the, in, in the great character of Robert E. Lee or Stonewall Jackson. Um, but, and uh, in the South, they had some other things to say about uh, General Ulysses Grant and, and, and so on that weren't in the Northern uh, textbooks. Um, but so the picture was painted differently, the, uh, the emphasis was on a different level. The, the military textbook could care less about anybody's character but didn't want to know a lot about the military hardware and the technology and the tactics. Um, but the same stuff, and it's in one sense it's that same basis, and really not as even anywhere near as extreme as that, so to speak, the same basis of the same historical data. And, and by the way, in the Civil War, it was data that would even um, make Bart Ehrlman happy because there were pictures taken. And, uh, you know, we have uh, more um, concrete stuff. We have the same data. Um, but, um, and, um, but different perspectives. And when you get that the pers not only the perspective, but so to speak, the data starts changing, and then you say, well, you know, thanks, but no thanks. Um, I want to, to make sure everybody's aware of the fact that each of these gentlemen teach at esteemed and, and important universities around the world. And to have the benefit of listening to them generally costs per tuition credit um, an extensive amount of do re mi. And uh, they have graciously uh, uh, come here and added this to the agenda for the weekend, uh, recognizing that it's a chance uh, for all of us to get to hear them at absolutely no expense, just to get to sit and enjoy some of the world's best teachers and minds on these issues. Thank mm -hmm. you.